In this presentation, I'll take some of the projects that I've worked on in the last few years as examples to talk about some of the applications of 3D modeling techniques to visualize various kinds of contexts at different scales. So we'll see examples of reconstruction of entire cities, but also of individual houses and the objects and furniture within. This will give me the opportunity to discuss the methods that are most appropriate for each case, a range of research questions we can investigate by using these tools, and the challenges that we encounter in the process. First, I'll talk about the 3D modeling of cities. The first case study will be the multi-period urban site of Coronia in Beotia, central Greece, which has been investigated by non-destructive methods within the ancient cities of Beotia project led by John Bainpliffe. The second case study is another Beotian city, Aliertos, also investigated by means of non-destructive survey methods as part of the Ancient Cities of Beotia project and of the Haliertos House project led by Emery Farinetti from the University of Roma 3. Finally, I'll briefly present a pilot project on the reconstruction of Amsterdam in the 16th century that is part of the Amsterdam Time Machine project led by Julia Nordegraaf at the University of Amsterdam. All these sites have in common that they are cities and therefore quite challenging contexts to be visualized in 3D in their entirety. And for this reason, I chose to approach their 3D reconstruction with a rule-based modeling strategy using the commercial software City Engine, which is mostly used nowadays for modern urban planning and geodesign. And in fact, the characteristic of City Engine that I'll be explaining further later on is its seamless integration with GIS. In the second part of this presentation, we we'll zoom in on individual houses and their interiors. Specifically, I'll talk about the reconstruction of the 17th century house of the painter Gillis van Koningsloh and that of the Amsterdam Patricia Peter de Graaf. In these cases, the object of study are historical houses and the characteristics of the data and the aims of the project called for a manual modeling approach. And I use for this the open source software Blender in combination with image-based modeling with the open source photogrammetric software Meshroom. So let's start with the cities. And before going into the various case studies, let's briefly talk about rule-based modeling and how it works so that it becomes clearer in case you're not familiar with this technique. As the name suggests, it means to create 3D models from a set of rules that follow a given shape grammar. Specifically, City Engine is based on the computer-generated architecture CGA shape grammar. As you can see in this short portion of a simple root file in this slide, the 3D geometry is constructed by progressively adding more details line by line. Here are two other ways to visualize the rules. So uh, what it does is clearer. You start with an extrusion, which creates a 3D volume from a 2D shape, and then you split the volume into individual faces, which allows you to work on each face by establishing parameters for further subdivision. The syntax is unique to City Engine, but the way in which it's written is similar to a scripting language, as you can see. Regarding Coronia, one of the aims of my PhD research within this project was to create a 3D environment that could act as a data integration platform to support the ongoing survey and as a simulation tool to visualize alternative hypotheses on the late classical urban layout. The survey has yielded a large data set of scattered and overall poorly preserved remains of the various phases of occupation of the site. And in this slide, you can see some examples of find. It's a complex site where the archaeological context has been disturbed by later activity since it has been extensively used for agriculture. The method of investigation that the survey team used to try to get as much information as possible was to rely on a combination of various data sources, from pottery and architectural surveys and geophysical prospections to the information gathered from ancient sources and early modern travelers' account. The survey is concluded, but the data processing and analysis is not completed yet. So what I'll be showing is the provisional 3D reconstruction that I made based on the available data. And I'm going to focus especially on architectural finds because I was directly involved in the survey. A rule-based modeling approach was the way 
to go, not just because manual modeling, the whole city would have been too time consuming, but also because since the data interpretation, as I said, is still in progress, we expect that the 3D reconstruction will need to be updated in the future. And the fact that the software city engine allows the integration with JS data was very important in our case, as our survey data are indeed stored in a JS. The first thing that I'm going to show you is the creation of a 3D JS of the survey finds. The starting point were the GPS points which recorded the architecture of finds that were on the hill. The attribute table of the shape file, where they were stored, contained information about the measurements, the type of stone that they were made of, and whether or not I had made a more detailed 3D model of any of them. I wrote a short CGA rule that retrieves these pieces of information from the attribute table and substitutes the points with blocks that are first of all scaled according to the dimensions in the shapefile and also textured according to the type of stone. In case an actual 3D model existed, the rule uses that instead. And this is done in ArcGIS by using the features from City Engine rule in the 3D analyst toolbox. What this jazz driven automated 3D modeling does is that it makes concentration and clusters of particular stones more intuitively visible um, on the 3D model of the hill. And it helps us in uh, the interpretation of the survey finds. And I did this for the architecture of finds, but it will be interesting to do something similar also for the pottery finds, for example, to see what kind of clustering comes out of that. As to the actual 3D reconstruction of the city, the rules that are written are based on comparative research on other Greek and Roman towns and architecture. And I specified and referenced in inline comments the sources that I relied on. And I added also explanations on modeling choices or parameters that I used. In the rules, I've included several parameters as attributes, for example, the height of the houses, so I can access them and change them on the fly in the city engine side menu, which is called inspector. And I've also included the possibility, for example, to select portions of the city walls and change them into towers. And this is because we found some evidence of towers only at two locations, while we know that there should have been more. So this gives us the possibility to display alternatives. We don't have time now to go into much details about all the characteristics of the files. Uh, the rules, but if you like to have a, a closer look, I put the rules that I made on GitHub and the link that you see in this slide. And I've uploaded an example of the 3D model of a house generated with this rule on Sketchpub. These rules have been one component of a more elaborate workflow, which comprises the survey data stored and displayed in a 3D GIS as initial input, together with the terrain information for which I suggested a reconstruction hypothesis based on historical area images and the results of the geomorphological analysis of the hill. In the rules, I've also included the possibility to calculate the slope value of each initial building lot, which made it possible to use this visualization for exploratory research to simulate in real time alternative hypotheses about the location and the number of houses that could fit on the hill and to compare them to our archaeological remains and to the information in historical sources. So in this short video, uh, in this uh, slide, you can see how the 3D city changes when a different slope threshold is given as input. And this process can help us to um, estimate population figures in Coronia independently from the information we can gather from historical sources. Coronia's 3D scene in City Engine is georeferenced and can be exported as multi-patch uh, multi features in a geodatabase and imported into RGIS. Given that data and reconstruction hypotheses are in the same spatial reference system, they can be overlapped and compared. And the integration with GIS allows for further analysis, for example, visibility analysis of a building from a specific point of view. 
The 3D scene is available online and includes two alternative hypotheses of Coronia's urban extent, which are both possible given the current state of our knowledge of this site. I've also set up a prototype cardboard VR in Unity to look around from the pedestrian point of view. And future work includes updating the 3D reconstruction and the virtual reality experience because we would like to make it available as an educational tool for local school children. I'm reusing and adapting the set of rules that are created for Coronia for another ancient town in Biosha, Liertos. And this will, gives us, uh, will give us interesting information to compare, as well as the possibility to refine the rules. The investigation of the hill of Aliertos includes the mapping of surface architectural features and similar artifacts carried out by my colleague Emery Farinetti and her students from the University of Romatra, and then uh, geophysics and then GPS surveys. A digital elevation model of the hill has been created starting from drone images. Similarly to Coronia, also at Aliertos, our aim is to explore various reconstruction hypotheses about the extent of the hill covered by housing quarters, which will help us to think about population figures and the relation and interaction of the city with its, with its countryside. The surface remains at Aliertos are more preserved and legible than at Coronia, and the fact that the ancient city was destroyed by the Romans during the Third Macedonian War in 171 BC, gives us a clear caesura in the urban phases. As to the practical workflow, I imported the street network and city wall perimeter as a shape file in City Engine. Um, as previously said, since the software allows a seam seamless integration with JS, the coordinates and attributes of geo files are maintained upon import. And by interpolating the street network, lots are created which correspond to the extent of the insula observed on site during the survey. The lots are then internally subdivided according to specific parameters, which represent the situation observed in the few insula that are better preserved than the rest of the urban area. Then the roof file for domestic architecture is applied on the lots to populate the hill with houses. Other roof files, also created for the Coronia case study, are used to create the city walls in the lower town and to texture the streets. As I said, the archaeological remains at Aliertos are better legible than at Coronia, but we are still confronted with varying data availability, quality and interpretation. This slide visualizes what kind of evidence we have on site. We want to incorporate and visualize this uncertainty into our 3D model. And the rule-based modeling strategy that we adopted allows us to account for varying data quality and to create alternative hypotheses to visualize the various scenarios. So instead of crystallizing our interpretation into one single visualization, we explore what the results are in each case. We're still in the process of doing this simulation and of comparing the results to the data collected. So uh, to see what, uh, what, which will be the most plausible scenarios. For example, on the uh, left, left side of this slide, we visualize, visualize what happens if we consider that all the insulae visible and inferred are occupied by houses. And I've written the rule in such a way that it's possible to automatically produce a report with the number of houses that have been created. Um, and um, on the scenario displayed on the right side of the slide instead, we exclude the insulae where the archaeological remains are absent or the in interpretation is uncertain, and the area where, which defines the possible location of the agora. So the first hypothesis represents the maximum extent, and the second, the minimum extent the Haliartos could have had in antiquity. This model will help us to think about the size of the city, um, its population, population, its interaction with the Cora, its territory. And uh, also the case study of Aliertos will offer an interesting comparison for Coronia. In fact, we know from a fragment of papyrus found at Oxyrhynchus, which describes the military organization of the Boeotian League at the beginning of the 4th century BC, that Aliertos and Coronia contributed the same amount of Boeotarchs, so the chief officers in each city of the Boeotian Confederacy, 
which should indicate that their population was of comparable size. So we'll be looking at what kind of results we get from this uh, simulation. The last example of procedural modeling that I'm showing you is the pilot project on the creation of a 3D model of Amsterdam in the 16th century within the framework of the Amsterdam Pen Machine. One of the aims of the Amsterdam Pen Machine is to develop a 3D, 4D, so which includes not only the volumetric properties but also changes through time. Um, as I said, a 3D, 4D grayscale urban model which will serve as a hub where social historical data on the city can be mapped, linked and queried. One of the aims of the Virtual Interiors project that I'm currently part of is indeed to provide a proof of concept for the Amsterdam machine, but I'll come back to this later in my presentation. Also, in this case, the most efficient approach uses CT Engine for the semi-automatic generation of buildings and its uh, GIS integration. And our student assistant, Stefan, Stefan Weyers, helped to collect a data set with information on the 16th century urban layout and the house's structural information. We rework the GIS vector layer to represent a reconstruction hypothesis of the urban layout at the time and associated the information on the preserved houses, for example, their height, their type of facade, their roof slope degree, the extent of preservation and also a list of published literature when available. I then imported the GIS data into City Engine and wrote a rule that takes the parameters stored in the GIS layer as input value for the city modeling. So this is a similar workflow to what I previously showed you with the architectural finds at Coronia, GIS-driven 3D modeling. In this case, the rule file I wrote assigns the color green to the houses for which we have some kind of information for the 16th century phase. So, it is possible to visually distinguish them from, the, from those for which the parameters for the 3D modeling have been inferred. I also imported a couple of manually modeled buildings, for example, churches, that were part of an early version of the 3D model of Amsterdam that the Amsterdam municipality had made a few years ago. This pilot, which was meant to develop and test the feasibility of this workflow, proved that it's suitable for this purpose. And in fact, it will allow us to continue storing our data into GIS and have a GIS-driven 3D modeling. And it also allows the efficient iterative updating of the 3D scene when new data are available. And the integration of manually modeled 3D models created in a different software when needed. The bottleneck in this case lies not much on, the, on creating the 3D visualization, but more on the time consuming task of data collection. So to conclude the first part on cities and procedural modeling, let's wrap it up with some final consideration on this technique. Regarding its strong points, we can say that it affords a formal, parametric and hierarchical, hierarchical description of the 3D geometry and the efficient modeling of large environments and recursive geometry. So it's in fact a very good approach to tackle the modeling of a city, being it ancient or modern. Because they are text-based, the rule files or section of them can be easily reused and adapted in other contexts, as I show you in the case of uh, Alertos, for example. And inline comments can be added, which are useful as a memory aid for the modeler, but also as a way to explain choices or to make references to sources for who's going to read the rules uh, later on. These characteristics enhance the replicability and the intellectual transparency of the uh, intellectual transparency of the modeling process, especially when we are trying to visualize remains that aren't existing anymore. It's also easy to update. I find it easier to update than models created with computer graphics software. And in fact, lines of code can be added in the rule files. The parameters can be easily modified. And also City Engine allows for a modular workflow, given that data and rule uh, work independently from one another. So this approach is very convenient for creating a hypothesis during an ongoing archaeological survey, for example, or in case uh, in which the data collection is still in progress. In addition, specific of the software city engine are the seamless integration with GIS, both in import and export. 
And uh, as you know, this is usually lacking or poorly supported in computer graphics software. Lastly, City Engine allows the possibility of importing and exporting numerous file formats. For example, you can import shape files and export georeferenced 3D geometries as geodatabases, as I said, but also numerous other common formats using, uh, used in 3D graphics, such as OBJ, Collada, uh, FBX. Um, so because of its characteristics, it's well suited to support an integrated approach for archaeological survey, historical research, data interpretation and visualization. As to is its weaknesses, um, procedural rules are not suited for detailed modeling, although there are ways to get around this by importing manually modeled 3D assets and subject them to procedural rules. And they are also not suited to replicate exactly as existing buildings. Also, they are not very time efficient for modeling individual buildings. So, as we saw, its strengths are related to the possibility to create architectural variations in a building type to fill in large areas. What is interesting, however, is to use it for the parametric modeling of alternative hypotheses of one building. So this has been the approach taken, for example, for the 3D reconstruction of one building at Portus in the Portus project by the University of Southampton. It's also quite challenging to model the building's interiors. And in the second part of my presentation, I'll talk about, in fact, manual modeling as the method to do that. Moreover, the CGA grammar is software specific. So you need to have City Engine to interpret the code. And just to make this point clear, you can read the rules with any text editor, but to be able to actually visualize the geometry that they describe, you need City Engine. And finally, the learning process of rule-based modeling and of City Engine is usually a bit more challenging than learning computer graphics software. So I find this graph, which is included in the software documentation, useful to show and to keep in mind if you'd like to learn this software. Uh, there is a certain amount of content creation after which the initial investment of time to write the rule files is compensated and otherwise manual modeling is still the best way to go. So let's see now a different type of context where manual modeling is the best approach. And to do so, we fast forward to the 17th century and go back to Amsterdam with the reconstruction of the houses of the painter Gilles van Koningslo and the Amsterdam born patrician Peter de Graaf. The aspect that I would like to bring into focus now is how 3D modeling helps us to visualize how space is described in historical records and to simulate the perception and the experience of space in the house interior. From a methodological point of view, I'll again pay attention to the different degrees of uncertainty in the reconstruction and to the elaboration of alternative hypotheses. In conclusion, I'll talk about how we can use present day methodologies to enable users to access this type of information. The research that I'll be talking about in this second part of my presentation is part of the Virtual Interiors project financed by the Dutch Research Council. Through spatial mapping and visualization methodologies in two and three dimensions, this project aims to investigate the creation and display of products of cultural industries. Think about paintings and books in 17th century domestic interiors, with the intention to add another piece of understanding to our knowledge of how Amsterdam became a great center of attraction and development for the cultural and creative industries at that time. So, who was Gilles van Koningslo. He was one of the most important and celebrated painters in Amsterdam at the turn of the 17th century. And he had a profound influence on the stylistic development in landscape paintings in the Dutch Republic. And in this slide, you see one of his works. In this project, one of the most important sources we are working with are probate inventories. And these documents were drawn up when a person died, or for example, in case of bankruptcy, to record the objects and furniture that were in their house. 
So this is as, as close as we can get to have an idea about what people have in their homes at the time and where did they keep them. Luckily, Conning's Law Inventory is organized room by room, which is not always the case, as many times you just find a list of objects without any special information as to where to place them. And um, interestingly, especially for the PhD project of uh, Bex Xuan Li, who we, uh, in our project is studying the artistic communities in Amsterdam, his inventory speaks about um, both a shop and a back shop. So he says a winkel and achterwinkel on the first floor, which alludes to the possibility that his studio and his painting shop were located in the same space on the upper floor of his house. This aspect has made this house an interesting case study to see what kind of contribution could 3D modeling give to our understanding of its internal room organization. There is a problem though, and this is that the exact location of his house has not been identified with certainty. Akaga sources uh, give us some indication of where he lived in Amsterdam, so we know that he used to live in the street that is now called Oude Turfmarkt, where the Allerpiece Museum is located, to give an idea. And some scholars have already made some hypotheses about a more precise location of his house, but without coming to secure and verifiable conclusions so far. This uncertainty didn't really have an impact on their study because they were interested in the presence of Koningslo and other painters in the same street. But of course, it does matter when your goal is to create a 3D reconstruction of his house, since its location and its dimensions are crucial information to correctly represent space and volumes. This has made it necessary to further dig in the archives, and I have to thank uh, Bart Röverkamp and Franz Heisenhau to greatly help in this process to attempt the time-consuming task of reconstructing the evolution of the street in time to be able to pinpoint where Koningslo's house was located. So I'll leave out the details of this research, but um, I put on this slide uh, some pictures of the kind of sources that I used. And just to give you an idea, an anchor point to correlate the different sources was the reference to the presence of a shared alley, which is also visible in the archaeological excavations that the archaeologists of the Amsterdam Monuments and Archaeology Office had dug in 2005. This first reconstruction hypothesis that I made is superimposed to the archaeological excavations and takes into consideration typical spatial arrangements that are found in other houses of the period, which match the room's order they're described in uh, Conning's Law Inventory. In this way, it gives us a possible explanation for the presence of the shop on the upper floor, which would have been directly reached from the fur house, the entrance hall, and therefore easily accessible for interesting potential buyers. So in Alawi, we're going to discuss we're going to discuss this interpretation and potentially come up with alternative hypotheses on the room arrangement. In any case, this case study shows how the creation of a 3D reconstruction influences the data gathering process because it inevitably confronts you with the gaps in our knowledge that you need to fill to reach the level of detail that you want to visualize. And if you can't fill the gaps because your sources are silent in this regard, then at least you can acknowledge and incorporate the uncertainty into the visualization. As you can see here, I chose for a wireframe rendering. I didn't want to use any visualization technique that would go towards a photorealistic rendering to convey the hypothetical nature of the reconstruction. And in the next and final example, I'll show another way to visualize uncertainty and provide access to the sources underlying the 3D reconstruction. This is the case of the entrance hall to the house that Peter de Graaf had built in 1664 on one of the larger canals in Amsterdam, the Herengracht. De Graaf that you see here in this portrait with his wife, Jacoba Bicker, was a member of one of the most influential families in Amsterdam at the time, together, in fact, with, with his wife. And he lived in this house until his death in 1707. For this case study, 
I could rely on a unique combination of data, which consists of a detailed probit inventory that was drawn up upon the craft staff and several other archival documents, most notably his almanacs, which he kept for over 40 years of his life and which contain, among other things, information on the construction was on his house. Another important source of information is the house itself, which is it's, it's still standing. So here we have no doubt about its location. However, the house has been obviously heavily modified over the century, both on the facade and inside. And the most significant, significant change for what I'm going to talk about um, in here took place in uh, 1868 with the replacement of the original entrance door with a window. And in fact, in these images, you can see the current state of the facade on your left and how it appeared in the second half of the 18th century on your right. And this is the earliest visual reference that is available for this house from which we can still see the entrance in its original location. This change had a strong impact on what was, first of all, the function, of course, but also the appearance of the entrance hall, which is nowadays absolutely unrecognizable. In fact, after the entrance was moved to the ground floor, this room has become an antechamber to the two side rooms. In these uh, images, you can see what this room looked like until last year, when the building hosted the Amsterdam Museum of Bags and Purses, which unfortunately had to permanently close due to the, uh, to the uh, financial difficulties caused by the corona crisis. This modification in function made this room particularly interesting for 3D modeling to shed light on its original appearance and in particular on its representational character as the access to the house and therefore the first room that visitors would encounter when they entered. Some building plans from 1974, made available by the Amsterdam Monuments and Archaeology Office, have been a useful starting point since they record some of the changes that the house underwent, for example, doorways that have been walled up at a certain point in time. And based on this documentation and on, uh, on site observations, I digitized and re-elaborated the plans in AutoCAD and imported them into Blender to reassemble them into the 3D frame of the house and to proceed further with the modeling of the house and some of the rooms, one of them in fact being uh, the entrance hall. So let's now see uh, in more detail which objects and furniture we find in this room according to the inventory. As you can see, there were two paper candle holders, a map of South Polsbroek, and South Polsbroek was part of the De Graaf family possessions outside Amsterdam, and De Graaf had inherited the title of Lord of this estate. Then we have an oak table with a marble top, a lint curtain from Izmir, a carved wooden bench, a marble table with a walnut foot, and two portraits in plaster. What stands out when comparing this inventory with other contemporary inventories is the total absence of paintings at the, in the entrance. And in fact, if you try to visualize this room in your mind, the walls would have appeared rather empty, given that according to the inventory, the only objects on the walls were two maps and the portraits. And here, the analysis of the almanacs has come to help, since in there we found out that the walls were decorated with 10 grisal paintings, so a grayscale painting technique that gives the illusion of depth. And also the allegorical, allegorical subjects of the four uh, largest ones, so um, the education, the dedication, the probity, and the piety. Starting from this data, the search began to find objects that corresponded to the description in the inventory and in the almanacs, which served as a starting point for the reconstruction. So just to give you a few examples without going into much uh, detail, for some of them, it was possible to find objects still preserved in the De, De Graaf family archive. And this is the case of this uh, handwritten map of South Polsbroek, which had been commissioned by De Graaf himself. 
or uh, objects that are directly related to his family. For example, for the plaster portraits, I proposed the identification with the copies of marble portraits of the Hrat's parents that you see in these images. And I used two different modeling techniques for these objects. For the map, a manual um, modeling in a blender with a very simple geometry and the color information given by the image of the map itself. While for the, for the portraits, I processed a series of photos in Meshroom. In other cases, such as for the tables, I relied on period furniture preserved in the Rijksmuseum. These are also models starting from images in Meshroom and then reworked in Blender, for example, to texturize the food with the correct material that is described in the inventory. For the bench and the grisailles, I based the 3D models on the interiors of the 17th century Dutch, Dutch uh, doll houses that provide contemporary miniature evidence of the uh, appearance of upper class homes at that time. Before talking about where these objects were placed in the room, I would like to briefly mention another aspect which the 3D reconstruction has allowed me to experiment on which is the reconstruction of the floor. And this is because the graph notes that uh, the number of size of uh, the tile that he used in the entrance floor and also gives us some indication to understand their pattern. We also know that the style of the time favored symmetry and therefore a typical combination was that with a coffered ceiling, as in this case, the floor tiles were arranged in such a way as to mirror its partition. So by combining this information in the 3D reconstruction, it was possible to propose these two alternatives for the floor pattern, where the number of tiles and the type of stones they're made of correspond to what the graph noted down in his homonyx. We see that the room gradually takes shape, but now we need to figure out the arrangement of objects and furniture. So by matching the rooms mentioned in the inventory with the 3D reconstruction of the interior, it was possible to retrace the path that the notary of her or his assistant followed to record the properties. And by looking at which rooms are named before and after the entrance hall, we can also establish from which door they enter this room. We also saw in the inventory that there is a curtain about half a way down the list which could only be placed hanging from the window above the entrance door. We have therefore these two points, the door giving access to the room and the position of the curtain to anchor the other objects on the list. And by keeping the order of the inventory, we arrived at this reconstruction hypothesis. And so we see that the two tables that in the list were separated by the curtain and the bench end up facing each other and thus contribute to the sense of symmetry of the room. And the bench ends up right next to the front door, a, conven a convenient location to accommodate visitors waiting for being received. The free space in front of the bench on the other side of the wall must have created the space to open the door shutter. So now we have a better idea of which objects the visitors entering the house had in front of them the maps with the city of Amsterdam, whose growth the Graaf family felt they had greatly contributed to, the map with their estates in Salzburg, and the portraits, which, if we accept my proposal of identification, could, in fact, represent the Graaf's parents. These elements and the allegorical images on the walls surrounding those who entered the room sent very clear messages about the history and the importance of the Graaf family, and also with the allegories in the grisailles, the qualities that the graph cherished. As in the previous case studies, the 3D reconstruction therefore provided a platform for integrated information from various sources, of course, it's totally different data resolution. And in this way, has helped to suggest which of the objects would be more visually prominent for a person entering the house. So we've seen that a reconstruction is the result of a complex process of data collection, analysis, and interpretation. This process, is, uh, this process in phase 
is very important and interesting, but unfortunately, it often remains hidden. In this case, the interpretations and choices I briefly mentioned are all documented in a spreadsheet and accompanied by an index that expresses the degree of certainty with which I have reconstructed an object. All this information and the 3D models come together in a prototype web viewer that my colleague Hugo Hurdeman has been working on for the Virtual Interiors project, which allows users to explore and interact with the 3D reconstruction. This is the desktop version, but the virtual reality version for a more immersive experience is also under development. The web viewer that I use for Coronia is the standard web viewer developed by Esri. And here we focused on developing our own with the functionalities that we deemed important to be included to make it into a virtual research environment. So for each object, users can access additional information on the reconstruction process. Also, um, direct links takes them to the, for example, the scanned copies of the um, archival sources that are used for the reconstruction. Um, here it is, directly to the archives. And this is a page from uh, the graphs, uh, one of the graphs uh, almanacs. And also to external resources with additional information, for example, on the artist or artisan who made the object. So this is a link, for example, to a cartico um, with um, the information on Lupinius, uh, which is, was the maker of this uh, map. And by leveraging the um, link data resources, we can show, for example, images of the same creator or of the same type, so that this environment can become indeed the starting point for further exploration and research. Annotations can be added on each of the objects, um, and uh, users can view an overlaid color-coded scheme of um, um, the different degrees of certainty in the proposed reconstruction. And they can also switch between hypotheses, for example, uh, the floor, so they can see uh, how these two different hypotheses of the floor pattern behave in the context of the room. This uh, research environment allows also uh, users to experiment with the effect of different lighting conditions and to interact with the objects, for example, by moving them, rotating them or scaling them to try out alternative positions or uh, hypotheses. So, to conclude, what I wanted to focus on in this presentation is how 3D reconstructions can be used in support of archaeological and historical research as tools which help us to think about and visualize how space was used and experienced in the past. They're powerful in combination with GIS. Uh, GIS-driven 3D modeling matches our usual way of storing data in a GIS, and you just need to think about the best way to structure your attributes in order to be able to retrieve these pieces of information with a CGA rule. The more these tools and visualization techniques become embedded into our research practice, the more we can shift their role towards a virtual laboratory and a platform for discussion, instead of just using them as illustrations at the end of our research. To this end, it's also important to be able to choose which methods are most useful for our purposes, but also which visualization modes are more appropriate to convey our message. Finally, the future of 3D reconstruction goes in the direction of integrating them in a virtual research environment like we did in the Virtual Interiors project, which enables users to gain, discover and create additional knowledge through the interaction with the 3D environment and the exploration of the underlying linked data. The main challenge that I see at the moment is to develop stable solutions for storing, accessing and publishing annotated 3D models. So I'm happy that there are more and more projects and initiatives that aim to accomplish this. 
so that 3D reconstructions can continue to be explored in the long term together with the underlying web of interrelated sources and reasoning, reasoning process that led to their creation so that their context of creation is kept intact and they become self-standing sources of information. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for listening.